Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the work of my co-authors, Sheila Thray of Texas A&M University and Micah Glantz of Colorado State University, without whom this presentation and the associated ideas would certainly not exist. I'd also like to say that I'm recording this video in Natick, Massachusetts, on unceded lands of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc peoples. As scholars of the human past, we owe it to ourselves, the discipline, and the broader community around us to be mindful of the many ways in which the past connects with the present and our responsibilities to both. More than 20 years ago, Sally McBurdy and Alison Brooks published their now foundational article, The Revolution That Wasn't, in which they demonstrated the inadequacy of a revolutionary model of behavior to explain the late Pleistocene archaeological record. In the years since, that paper has become one of the most cited publications in recent human evolution scholarship. McBurdy and Brooks opened their conclusion by saying, the search for revolutions in Western thought has been in part a search for the soul, for the inventive spark that distinguishes humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. In this talk, we would like to suggest that the search for an identification of modernity in the hominin fossil record involves a similar abstract search to the detriment, in our view, of our evolutionary understanding of the emergence of contemporary humans. In this talk, we make the argument that our understanding of the evolutionary origin of contemporary humans is constrained by our reliance on an outdated and typological model of modernity itself. Modernity gets similarly invoked as an explanatory framework for genetic, archaeological, and hominin fossil evidence, data sets that are often independent, varied, and sometimes mutually exclusive of one another. In this context, modernity often acts as a proxy for the relationship between available morphological traits in a sample, inferred behavioral attributes in an archaeological assemblage, or the position of genetic sequence data within an inferred phylogeographic model. This leads to a confusing array of invocations of the concept across different localities, across different temporal contexts, that often centers the designation of modernity itself rather than the evolutionary processes responsible for its appearance or the varied manifestations in which it appears, or the relationship between the varied lines of evidence used to invoke modernity. We make the argument that our current rendering of anatomical modernity is inconsistent with the existing record of human origins, that it largely reflects a Eurocentric gaze towards Africa to the exclusion of Asian perspectives and data, and that it has the effect of focusing paleoanthropology more on aspects of categorization and identification instead of a consideration of evolutionary process. Put simply, modernity is not an evolutionary reality, but is instead a category that changes with each new discovery from a particular time period and place, a fluid construct that we rely on to understand the origin of our species. To make our argument, we look objectively at three lines of evidence. The distribution of middle to late Pleistocene fossil localities and their relative abundance in Africa and Asia in particular, the pattern of similarity in craniometric variation as it relates to a typological construction of anatomical modernity and its emergence from Africa, and the history of the development of the idea of anatomical modernity as applied to modern human origins in the published scholarship. As a first step, we can simply ask, what and where are the fossil data for modern human origins? In other words, if we wanna build an empirical model of human evolution in the later Pleistocene, where would the data direct us? For this analysis, we excluded the European Neanderthal record, but simply because that record is disproportionately large, and our primary question of interest is the relative role of Asia versus Africa in models of anatomically modern and modern origins. However, we tried to create as comprehensive a listing of later middle Pleistocene, transitional middle to late Pleistocene, late Pleistocene, and transitional late Pleistocene to Holocene fossil localities by region. From these data, we looked at the overall distribution of sites in Eurasian, African, and Australia, site density by content, continent, and chronological coverage across these regions. The complete data set included 129 localities. It goes without saying that historically, this focus has disproportionately been on European localities, which together with taphonomic biases have led to a fossil and archaeological record strongly biased towards European locales. As it relates to the construction of notions of anatomical modernity, this has often had the effect of positioning Africa as the origin point of modernity, but in relation to the much larger existing European fossil and archaeological record. This relationship has played a role in the long-standing debates and desires to establish clear associations between renderings of anatomical modernity in the fossil record with behavioral modernity, such as the Upper Paleolithic or Late Stone Age assemblages in the archaeological record. Integrating genetic conceptions of modernity into this framework have been waylaid by the absence of ancient DNA from deep time horizons in Africa, but has instead shifted the focus to an array of not modern genetic profiles from across Eurasia.
A couple of things become readily apparent looking at these data. While we center the emergence of anatomical modernity in Africa, the representation of fossil localities in Africa from this time period is considerably limited by both time and space. Asia contains more sites with hominin cranial fossils, and this larger number also has more time sampled than those sites from Africa. This is true of both earlier time horizons, such as those seen here, and even more so for later time horizons, which depict how we construct modernity in the, uh, as it emerges out of the Pleistocene. As a reminder, Neanderthal sites have been excluded from this analysis, but broken down by time period, Asia has a greater number of both middle and particularly late Pleistocene fossil sites in comparison with Africa. This is true even when the relatively rich hominin Levantine area is taken out of Asia and added to, added to the African sample. Some of this is potentially a product of its large size, but even when we look at site density, Asia has a greater representation of sites, particularly in the later Pleistocene. Both regions, of course, are trumped by Europe, not surprising because of the arms race during the late 19th and 20th century for the first modern human and evidence that it would keep Neanderthals as a side branch. Particularly when we think about the timing of these evolutionary transitions, as well as connecting anatomical notions of modernity with the archaeological record, the chronological representation for this time period is also significant. Asia also has a higher representation of well-stratified fossil localities, including cave sites, than Africa. There's a lot more that we and others could say about these data, but in the context of our talk today, I would simply like to point out that there's a greater fossil evidence for the time period covering the emergence of contemporary humans in Asia than there currently exists within Africa. If our quest is to understand the pattern of anatomical variation in fossil hominins from this time period, this would suggest Asia should be a larger part of that conversation than it is currently in most discourses of modern human origins. What does the morphology of these fossils then look like? In recent years, there's been a growing consensus on the consolidation of a modern cranial anatomy from redated and therefore potentially earlier African sites, such as Omo and Jebel or Hood, with a focus particularly on the rise of a globular neurocranium. Under a scenario in which anatomical modernity is serving as a proxy for Homo sapiens, we would expect to see a temporal and spatial pattern associated with the expansion of this morphology out of Africa. To address this question, we compiled a data set of 135 relatively well-preserved hominin crania and a set of 36 standardized measurements encompassing the neurocranium, basocranium, and facial skeleton. We imputed missing values for these data using an iterative process based on the existing covariance pattern of the sample and conducted a principal component analysis to visualize the multivariate pattern of variation associated with these fossils. Here are the composite results for PC1 and PC2 of that analysis. PC1 in this case accounts for about 58% of the overall variance in the sample, heavily influenced by measurements of the neurocranium in particular, with a facial skeleton to a somewhat lesser degree. A clear temporal gradient can be seen from the lower left. Um, earlier fossils are in the shades of blue to the upper right in this figure, with later fossils in shades of orange and red. Highlighting just the Asian sample illustrates this effect a little more clearly, but also shows a wide range of variation, particularly in later Pleistocene hominins from East and Southeast Asia. It is particularly interesting to look at the overlap between this Asian sample highlighted here against the African record in shadow behind it. This image is focusing solely on the middle to late Pleistocene sample, but under an evolutionary scenario in which anatomical modernity emerges as a typologically identifiable suite of characters, one might expect to observe a discontinuity, or at least a pronounced dissimilarity, between the earlier and later Asian fossils in this sample. That is not, however, what is observed. We might instead suggest that the larger Asian fossil sample is perhaps sampling a broader range of morphological variation that might be associated with the evolutionary events leading to the emergence of contemporary humans. In other words, we would argue that the morphological data are not consistent with a simple construction of anatomical modernity as an emergent and exclusively African morphology. What is interesting is that if we instead exclude the Asian and Australian samples, there is actually a more coherent, simpler case for specimens like those of Jebel or Hood, Omo, and the Levantine material to serve as a transitional form of early modernity connecting later European Homo sapiens with their African progenitors. But why would we choose to exclude the data from Asia when they are distributed across a larger area and at a greater density than those sites from Africa? And they also represent a more continuous sequence of time. Why would we eliminate most of the record that can speak, in other words, to the evolution of Homo sapiens? If the Asian record accounts for a substantial portion of the relevant fossil record, and the morphology of this sample is not at least obviously consistent with a simple understanding of anatomical modernity, why does that construct persist? 
In order to address this final question, we conducted a citation network analysis of modern human origins and anatomically modern Homo sapiens and its variants. Um, the goal of this analysis was simply to examine not simply the objective evidence for human evolution, but also the evidence for the development of our understanding of recent human evolution through a history of science approach. This complicated figure shows a network diagram based on web of science shared citations of modern human origins with a minimum cutoff of 15 shared citations. This encompasses about 700 total publications and a couple of points are noteworthy to start. First, while these clusters are not entirely discrete, they show the strong influence and in clustering of genetics, yellow largely in this figure, morphological studies, largely in red, archeological papers, largely in blue, and the green cluster sort of covering a hybrid set of papers that bridge the gap between these. Second, discussions of anatomical modernity serve as the central hubs in this network, bridging across the different subfields, subfields and lines of evidence. Not entirely evident from this figure itself, but in the process of preparing these data for the analysis, it, being, it is hard to overstate how in this kind of analysis, the genetic papers take on a disproportionate role in terms of simple citation metrics. Some of this is the product of differences in the academic publishing ecology of human genetics versus paleoanthropology, but it also reflects the large role that genetic data have played in shaping notions of modernity. With that in mind, it's worth taking a step back and looking at how interpretations of the available genetic evidence for late Pleistocene human evolution have changed over time. The historical legacy of the idea of anatomical modernity emerging alongside Homo sapiens is deeply embedded in our understanding of this time period, even as contemporary interpretations of the available evidence have become far more complex. Going from Can, Stone King, and Wilson's foundational 1987 treatment of mitochondrial DNA variation, for example, Green et al.'s first definitive statement about Neanderthal ancestry in living humans, to Prufer et al.'s statement in a publication on a complete Vindia genome from 2017 that it is, quote, likely that gene flow occurred between many or even most hominin groups in the late Pleistocene. This is a striking and dramatic turnaround in a relatively short time period for interpreting the genetic evidence for modern human origins. Going back to the previously illustrated network, but now visualized as a density cloud rather than a network, this makes it a little bit easier to see publication details. It's interesting to reflect back on the legacy of the out of Africa versus multi-regional arguments of the 80s, 90s, and aughts. Based on citation data, the out of, our, out of Africa argument is far more represented in the published literature. Articles like Stringer and Andrews' 1988 Genetics and the Fossil Evidence for the Origin of Modern Humans are key hubs not just for conveying ideas about the African origin of modern humans and connecting anatomical modernity with other archeological and genetic lines of evidence, but also as the nodes through which alternative models of late Pleistocene human evolution have been interpreted and have come to be understood. For example, if we look at the Wolpoff, Wu, and Thorne 1984 paper, one of the first full articulations of multi-regional evolution, and if we've examined the network of papers that have cited it, which is what this fixture, fixture figure here is showing, that paper is principally interpreted through works like Stringer and Andrews' 1988 piece or Can Stone King and Wilson's 1987 piece. In contrast, the overall reach and scope of Stringer and Andrews' 1988 piece is broader and deeper. It is itself more heavily cited, hence the larger node size here, and it has more associated edges, in other words, publications that cite it, given the same data cutoff. This is in no way meant as a criticism of Stringer and Andrews' piece, for example, but merely as an objective illustration of the flow of ideas that have played a role in shaping the intrinsic biases associated with the historical development of the discipline. Models postulating an Asian role in modern human origins are simply and objectively less represented in the literature. As we wrap up, and at the risk of sounding both old and overly flippant, perhaps we should, as a discipline, stop trying to make modernity a thing. By that, I simply mean perhaps it is time to abandon modernity in the context of current purposes as a useful or representative way of framing human evolution in the late Pleistocene. Anatomical modernity, even as it exists in the late Pleistocene, is not a singular phenomenon. Without meaning to suggest that Africa is not central to our evolutionary history and that the process by which contemporary humans evolved, it most certainly is. There's a wealth of evidence that it is not exclusively so, and that our understanding of these events would be aided by focusing instead on the specific interaction of evolutionary forces within local, regional, and global context. Such an approach, including the abundance of evidence from Asian context, may better represent the complexity of our origin as a species.
As just one final note, I think it's worth highlighting the extent to which newly identified forms and groups of middle to late Pleistocene hominins over the past two decades are disproportionately found in East and Southeast Asia. One way of thinking about this, instead of conceptualizing uh, late Pleistocene radiation of hominins, something that I think is incongruous with our current understandings of late Pleistocene hominin ecology and genetics, is seeing this as a reflection of the incompatibility of typological notions of anatomical modernity with the reality of a diverse and varied fossil record. A fossil record shaped not merely by replacement of populations through adaptive mechanisms, but instead by a complex interplay between environment, demography, and evolution playing out in locally specific contexts. One notable exception to this is Homo naledi from South Africa, which serves as the exception that proves the rule in many respects, in that Homo naledi, despite being concurrent with some of the newest dates from African anatomical modernity, is almost never invoked in the context of African origins of Homo sapiens. And with that, we welcome your questions.